And I'll pause for a little bit. Um, hello, everybody. Um, welcome to PMP Live. I'm Beth Wong, and I work in events for Politics and Prose. We thank you so much for joining us in this new format where we're continuing to bring you the authors you love and their new books to our Politics and Prose community. At any time during the event tonight, you can click on the big green button below and purchase tonight's book on PNP's website. Uh, we are currently offering reduced uh, shipping as an incentive, especially as our physical stores are closed and we need your online purchases in order to keep bringing you the programming PNP is known for. It's $5 flat fee for shipping. Tonight, as a um, Really special treat. We have uh, a conversation partner, Dara Lind, uh, with Alina Glass, author of No Justice in the Shadows. Um, you can ask the author a question. We're clicking on Ask a Question at the bottom of your screen. You can type your question in that box, and you can see the other questions that other viewers have asked tonight. You can vote for the ones you want to hear heard the most, or you can submit your own. Um, go ahead and start asking those questions as soon as you've got them. Uh, a reminder that unlike our in-person events, the author, host, and audience members cannot see you through the screen. We welcome you tonight. Come as you are in your pajamas, in your work clothes, in your whatever. We're so happy you're here. Um, on to the main event. In her important new book, No Justice in the Shadows, Alina Glass, immigration rights activist, lawyer, and professor at NYU School of Law, shows that Trump's anti-immigration stand is only the latest if most extreme, iteration of the idea of the criminal alien. Alina is joined tonight in conversation by, uh, by Dara Lind, immigration reporter for ProPublica, former senior correspondent at Vox, and co-host of the podcast, The Weeds. Welcome, Alina and Dara. Thank you. Thank you, and good evening to everybody who's out there. Um, Alina, I wanted to, I mean, Understanding that this is kind of a weird situation, <laughs> obviously for you not being, you know, down here in DC. Um, also, that we're living through a time when it kind of seems like there is only one story that matters, and you know, working on a book that ostensibly isn't about that at all. Um, but I, but you know, we've been talking over the last few days, and I know that in fact, this, you know, what you and your colleagues have been working on right now is a logical extension of the work that you've been doing into the coronavirus era. And so since so much of your book and the, one of the one of the really things I really appreciated about it is how much it's grounded in the stories of your clients. Um, could you maybe kind of talk through the cases that you're working on right now and how the immigration system looks during a pandemic from the perspective of the people you're trying to reach? Sure, and, and thank you so much, Dara, for being here, and thanks to Politics and Prose and to Bold Type Books and to all of you who I wish I could see um, but can't right now. Um, I really appreciate you taking a moment, especially during this horrific time, um, to be here and to hear us chat about um, some of the themes that this book covers. And sadly, I have to say that you know, when I started writing the book, I never imagined it would come out during a pandemic. Um, I never imagined that our immigration system would quite look and feel the way it's looking and feeling right now, um, which is to say a lot because, you know, I had a very low level of expectations for what, what we could see, um, particularly from the current administration when it comes to immigration policy. But I, I could never imagine things would be quite like this. And I have to say, sadly, you know, the themes that I cover in the book are are really more relevant than ever, given what we're hearing um, from the White House, from federal immigration agencies like ICE, which is Immigration and Customs Enforcement. They're the folks who are, you know, going to people's homes and arresting people and, and really in charge of what folks call interior enforcement as well as CBP and Border Patrol, CBP being Customs and Border Protection, um, who are really the ones at the border. Um, and we're seeing a lot of horrific changes happening there now too. And um, I guess in the ways that, that I think the book is particularly relevant and what I'm seeing in the cases of clients and people I care very deeply about um, being affected by current policies under um, COVID-19 and this pandemic uh, is the way in which the federal government's policy right now is to essentially 
devalue human life in the name of public safety. And it's something that really angers me because my, my clients and the people that I've had the privilege of working with and for for many years, um, they are members of the public, right? So they, they live in our communities. They were living their lives just fine um, before ICE came knocking on their door in the early morning hours to take them away. They were the ones who were dropping their kids off at school when ICE would come in. And this, this public safety rhetoric, um, this defense of these actions uh, is really what prompted me to write the book in the first place, um, to see the way in which, um, you know, you can keep over 30,000 people locked up in jails, knowing that they are at such heightened risk for um, contracting a deadly disease um, and claim it's because of public safety when this is a civil immigration system, people are being held because they lack paperwork, paperwork that we made a choice for very bad reasons, as they discuss in the book, uh, to, to essentially criminalize and to require when we never needed to do that in the first place. Um, so I think that that the, re the, the behavior of the government right now is shameful on so many different levels, and immigrants are really taking the hit, including many of my clients. Can we talk about Udman Khan? Yes, we can. <laughs> um, so Usman Darbo is a 26-year-old husband and father. Um, I had the privilege of meeting him through his longtime immigration lawyer, uh, Sophia Garule from the Bronx Defenders, uh, who has been representing him for a number of years. And she brought in my clinic. I teach the Immigrant Rights Clinic at NYU Law School. And she brought in my clinic and my students um, to represent Usman um, to try and get him out of detention. Um, and I have to say, you know, his case exemplifies so much of what's wrong with this system. Um, there's a great uh, profile of Usman's case on Vox um, that, that really talks about how he ended up facing deportation as part of the school to prison pipeline. You know, he came to the United States when he was just six years old. Um, he ended up growing up in the Bronx with his family. He was in you know, the poorest congressional district in the country. Um, and he quickly found himself being turned from an honor student um, into somebody who was getting kicked out of school and harassed by police um, uh, in his neighborhood as a black man. He's an immigrant from, um, from the Gambia. And, um, and so it didn't take long before he ended up getting some juvenile offenses and that was his entry point into the um, criminal legal system and part of this pipeline. But he, um, you know, he served his time and he changed his life and he was ready to move on. But because of the way our immigration law works, um, instead of being able to get that second chance that he earned, um, he was thrust into a new pipeline and that's the deportation pipeline. And that's where he remains today. Um, I decided to write this book in 2017 in the summer. And actually that same month is when ICE took him. Today is day 995 of his detention. Uh, our government has been locking up this man for that long. And what's more outrageous about his case is that you know five days after he was initially locked up by ICE, he found out that his partner, a US citizen who lives in the Bronx, uh, was pregnant with their first child. And even though ICE had the discretion to release him, they refused. And that little girl has grown up. She just had her second birthday um, earlier this month. She's grown up her entire life without having her dad by her side. That's what the immigration policies are, you know. And to make matters worse, um, you know, we did have a moment where we thought the tide would turn earlier this year, um, thanks to incredible advocacy by his family, by, you know, his community in New York, um, by the Bronx Defenders, by others. Uh, Governor Cuomo actually granted Usman one of his very rare pardons. Um, so in February of this year, that that um, conviction, he, the last, his only adult conviction that Usman has received was for, for an unarmed robbery, um, for which he maintained his innocence, but took a plea deal um, uh, to get out of Rikers as a, as a young man. You know, that happened a very long time ago, and, and Governor Cuomo listened, and he, he pardoned Usman. And we thought that was it. We thought we could go to ICE and ICE would finally say, oh, you're right. You know, we've been keeping him locked up because of this. We don't have to. We're going to let him go. He's been pardoned. And they didn't care. They gave us a one page decision 
saying that they were going to continue to lock him up because of his conviction without even mentioning the fact that it had been pardoned. I mean, that's the kind of bureaucracy he's stuck in. And before people say, well, if you're an immigrant, that's what you get. I think the important thing to remember, again, is that he's somebody who did what was expected of him. He, he changed his life. And it's not just him, it's his entire family. It's his wife and his child who are suffering because of what our government is doing to him. And the fact that even today, with a pandemic, despite our requests for his release, he's sitting in Bergen County Jail, which is the epicenter for the COVID-19 cases, the first place in the country that had a positive COVID-19 case um, among people held by ICE. He remains there. And thus far, neither ICE nor the courts have been willing to release him. Um, thankfully, we're going to keep fighting. Um, a shout out to my students, um, Amy Joseph and Cynthia Lee, who have been litigating this nonstop with Sophia and myself um, over the last uh, several months. We're going to keep fighting until someone listens, but it shouldn't have to be this hard. And his life is worth far more than what our government is is doing to him. It's it's a real travesty of justice. The thing about, you know, Usman's story or, you know, it for that matter, many of the cases that you talk through in the book is that it really, once you start hearing the same, once you start recognizing the same kind of themes and motifs in the history of immigration enforcement, stuff just keeps coming up. Like listening to you, I'm thinking about some of the stuff you have in the book about the push pull between state and local uh, law getting made to criminalize immigrants. And then sometimes, you know, and, and the federal government kind of following suit or conversely, you know, trying to reduce the extent to which state and local governments can can claw back. But something else that's very, that's, that's predominant in the book is kind of a history of accident where the same system that ends up incurring these consequences for someone then realizes that it didn't necessarily mean to do all of that collateral damage and tries to kind of claw it back. Is that, you know, to, to what extent do you see this as a history of intentional harm versus a history of kind of tragic neglect? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's a little bit of both and it depends on what actors you're looking at. So, you know, I mean, really the point of my book overall is to say that we're, we've are we been looking at immigration policy and, you know, approaching this debate in the wrong way. You know, we, like the title of the book is No Justice in the Shadows. And part of the reason I decided to call it that is because, you know, we're constantly being told, even by folks who are part of progressive movements, um, people who don't like the um, the consequences, who realize that it's too harsh, we're constantly being told that like what we need to be doing is making sure that um, that certain immigrants can come out of the shadows and, and debating who those immigrants are, who deserves to come out of the shadows. When in reality, I think the question we should be asking and the question that history teaches us to ask is why those shadows exist in the first place. And with respect to that question, it is absolutely intentional. So if you go back into the history of our immigration system, when we started creating federal laws around immigration to begin with, that, that whole project is very much tied up with projects of anti-Blackness, um, uh, of colonialism, of, of really the way we treat people of color and indigenous people, and how immigrants got placed into that hierarchy. And so you see the first federal laws, um, these choices that we're making that are intentional, come up during a time where, uh, you know, the borders of the United States were changing, um, Chinese immigrants were coming in initially welcome for their labor, and then during an economic downturn become demonized. And very quickly, we have this very racialized criminalization. You know, a lot of people are familiar with the Chinese Exclusion Act being one of the very first federal immigration laws. Um, again, going back to that like intentional choice. But even earlier than that was something I talk about in the book, um, a law in 1875 called the Page Act, which specifically, you know, before they were testing the waters, instead of going full-throatedly out um, against Chinese immigrants, they talked about barring convicts and prostitutes. They used language 
that anti-immigrant folks out in California um, had really adopted as ways of trying to drive Chinese people out and playing on the stereotypes. And so this is a constant theme in the book, you know, that um, from the history we see that, you know, immigrants, like it really starts when immigrants um, are being associated with criminality. It's like a rhetoric. And then you actually see laws that criminalize behavior. You know, this is true of drug laws. It's true of our border. You know, there were a time where some of the acts that we criminalize today were not considered criminal acts. But when they got associated with people of color and with immigrants, that's where we start seeing laws um, that treated these as crimes. And then once you have a group of people who are both quote unquote criminal and quote unquote alien, you suddenly have this category that starts to justify a huge deportation machinery. And that is, and then that cycles right back into the rhetoric. And so we see that cycle throughout history until today, which is very intentional. At the same time, we see groups, um, like you mentioned, who, who can kind of step back and look at pieces of this machinery and recognize that there's a wrong. And you know, thanks to the work of incredible activists and scholars and others, journalists, um, we have a much better understanding, for example, of the horrors and the real like racist foundations of our criminal legal system. And so there's a much better conversation. It's certainly by no means perfect, but a much better conversation that we're having today about the unintended and intended consequences of the criminal legal system and how we're supposed to be dealing with that as a policy, um, which is really wonderful and gratifying to hear. Um, but yet sometimes when we, we, we push just a little bit further and we say, okay, well, we can recognize that, um, you know, every arrest, like every police encounter, arrest, um, charge, conviction, sentence in our criminal legal system is racially charged, that there is a uh, discriminatory element that runs throughout the entirety of the criminal legal system. Somehow we have that conversation about deportation, it stops and people assume that, well, you know, if you've, if you've um, been arrested or if you have a conviction and you're an immigrant, of course we, you know, somebody has to be deported, so why not you? when the reality is that um, you know, we shouldn't be questioning like who deserves deportation, who doesn't deserve deportation. We really should be asking, you know, why are we deporting people? Because deportation itself is such a harsh consequence for something that again, you roll back the history, was a choice that we made about paperwork you know, uh, during a time where we were a lot more open about the fact that as a country we were being racist. Yeah, I, I admit that this is one of the uh, episodes in the book that I like had no idea about. It was the first time the Supreme Court kind of took up the question of whether it was cool to deport, you know, the Chinese immigrants who had already been, you know, the Chinese immigrants who had already settled in the U.S. before the Chinese Exclusion Act. And the extent to which, you know, only after the policy of deportation arose did the court consider the question of, oh, you know, is it actually the same thing to say that someone can't come here and to say that if you've been living in the U.S., we can kick you out. Um, it, it is, you know, it, it's a reminder of just how much, so much of the system has kind of been like, making potentiality more likely, so more aggressive enforcement that then leads to places that the initial law didn't necessarily contemplate. Um, I was wondering if you could actually talk a little bit more about like the dynamic of criminalization and the way that kind of ideas and rhetoric feed into law, because that's really one of the main engines driving the narrative of your book. And it can be a little bit, you know, I think if you have like the basic 101 level understanding of the history of US immigration law, you know, there used to be an explicit national quota system where you know, if you were an immigrant from Southern or Eastern Europe, much less anywhere else in the world, you weren't going to be able to get in. And the 1965 INA, the Immigration and Nationality Act, or the Hart Seller Act, like, you know, ended up opening up immigration to a lot of people and did abolish this kind of facially, like, national origins based facially racist system. So when we talk about or you know when when you talk in the book about the persistence of the racist roots of the pre-65 system, 
that can be a little bit more complicated because it is, you know, something, it, it is a different dynamic coming from a different place in the law than the, we are going to make this system based on, you know, we are going to determine who can come in based on the countries that we think can assimilate to us best. Yeah, so I think, you know, and it's, it's clear that, um, and this again gets into the intentional, unintentional dynamic here, it's clear that changes that were brought in 1965, you know, that, that was writing a set of wrongs, right? So, you know, eliminating the national origins quotas um, was a huge step forward in terms of recognizing, at least on its face, that our immigration law should not be based on like where people came from. And other scholars who I talk about in the book have done an amazing job of, of really showing how much those national origins quotas um, were about race, race specifically, and, and really defining a white race and what that means to be American. And I think there's a whole history of that. Your proximity to whiteness as an immigrant, you know, it's it wasn't a, a static definition, it's changed over time, but it's always been a defining feature of whether or not you could get those papers, whether you could come here and, and belong. Um, and it's something we feel, you know, currently today. Um, so change, you know, getting rid of those quotas was was a huge deal. Um, but I, it's no surprise, um, and that's what I try and articulate in the book, that here we are all these years later, and we now have more deportations, more imprisonment, um, more exclusions than we ever had previously, that the system has only grown. Um, and there are very specific forces, um, white supremacist, openly white supremacist forces, including the legacy of someone named John Tanton, who has you know, formulated a number of organizations over the years that have tried to promote this idea of like, okay, well now we have the system, we have to make it fair, lower immigration, protect Americans, doing it in ways that are very coded um, racially, but not as explicit. There's a whole system out there that is designed to make Americans believe that now our immigration system is just based on questions of what is good for the country versus what is not as opposed to being a system that is designed to now keep out immigrants of color in different ways now that we don't have national origins quotas. And so there's a chapter in my book um, where I talk uh, about a man I named mean, Lefty Lee, who's actually my first client um, as a lawyer, well, really as a law student, um, back when I first started in this work. Um, and I talk about the fact that, you know, it's no accident that he and his family came to New York um, and came to the United States in the early 1970s um, from Hong Kong, had he tried to come any earlier, um, uh, you know, he would have been facing uh, these barriers and these quotas preventing him from being here. So it's no accident he came then, but it's also no accident that by the mid 1990s, he found himself locked up in an immigration jail facing deportation, even though he was a green card holder, even though he had lived you know, his entire life and had by that point become a grandfather, you know, he was facing deportation in the late 1990s. We, we basically used the criminal legal system and the mass incarceration system that grew in the 70s, 80s, and 90s as a response to civil rights reforms, including the immigration reforms. We, we've created a system that has penalized immigrants in different ways, that have used different threat narratives to talk about the same people now that we don't, uh, well, most of us, I guess now the president still does use uh, openly racist rhetoric to talk about immigrants. But, you know, for the most part, many Americans don't use that rhetoric now. And we justify the current system um, because we're able to use this colorblind language to talk about immigration policy. When, in fact, we are simply targeting the same people now that there um, there aren't quotas to, to prevent that that wall. We have we're now building different walls, both the walls at the border and prison walls as well. Maybe to give a little bit more uh, specificity to that, and, maybe, and you know, to commit like a little bit of policy upon everybody listening, uh, maybe we could talk through the concept of moral turpitude some, because it's it's one of those where like people who aren't immigration nerds are usually wildly surprised at how important a phrase that sounds like it's out of a you know 1920s tract mm -hmm. <laughs> in immigration law. Sure. So, um, yeah, it's interesting because, you know, immigration law today now has, um, you know, long sections devoted to what types of criminal offenses might prevent you from coming to the U.S., um, from staying here, 
what can lead to someone being deported. Um, and one of the things that I try to emphasize to people when I'm talking about this issue, again, is that really no one is immune, right? You can be a green card holder, you can have your lawful permanent residency, and then if you have a certain kind of conviction, uh, you can be deported, and, and there's no statute of limitations. So it could be, you know, a conviction you had, uh, like a theft conviction you had when you were a teenager, um, and if it's considered an adult conviction, there you are, you know, 20 years later, you're traveling back from visiting your grandma, and suddenly you're taken into an immigration jail. It happens every day, and it's a, it's, it's a constant um, and expected part of the deportation system. So, um, so one of those categories is called a crime involving moral turpitude. And if you're wondering, what's a crime involving moral turpitude? Yes, I am too. I mean, after all of these years of litigating cases, of studying this, of teaching this course, it's still impossible for me to do anything but quote the variety of, of definitions that different agencies have given this term because it really has no meaning. Um, what I found really interesting about this term is that it came up, it was added to immigration law in the late 1800s um, shortly after uh, the after Congress started, you know, writing federal immigration law for the first time, and they they didn't bother to define it then either. They just kind of said it: if you were convicted of this, then then you could be excluded from coming into the United States. Um, what's so interesting, and this is work that other scholars have done as well, is that um, this term also found its way into lots of different laws during that same time. And one of the places where it was first emerging was um, in laws that, that came out of the, the backlash to uh, emancipation that used moral turpitude as a reason to block um, people from being able to have the right to vote, um, the right to participate. Uh, really, again, another example of how anti-Blackness and this idea of controlling free Black people also emphasized the way um, uh, the federal government started responding to immigrants as well. And the idea was like, if we create a category that's kind of vague, that allows us to include things like vagrancy, like, you know, petty theft, the kinds of crimes that Black people in particular were targeted for under Jim Crow laws, we, we create a category called crimes involving moral turpitude, then the people in power can decide when those, those categories apply, and they can enforce different laws based on that. So just like in voter suppression, we suddenly see this term popping up in our immigration law. Um, and, and at that point in time, again, somebody who's in, familiar with the history, a person of privilege um, who never had to experience being targeted this way, will read a term like that and say like, that makes sense. You know, I don't want someone being here if they have committed a crime involving moral turpitude, that sounds bad. And once again, we have this growing division of our communities into good and bad immigrants when in reality, it's just a tool, it's just a way of dividing and conquering and really showing that um, we can we can use this wide discretion to target um, people of color and people who are least able to defend themselves in the system. And when, when we were talking earlier, you mentioned that you don't think of this book as a book about the Trump administration, you think of it as a book after the person who comes after him. And I think that that's, I, 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 I'm interested in hearing you elaborate a little more about that, but I'm also not sure that it's a fair description because I think that when when people hear that, it's very easy to imagine the kind of nonfiction book that is this sweeping like, and now I'm going to take immigration law in the last chapter of my book and like lay out you know, a plan for like what a better system would look like. And instead what you've done is on one hand point to the, the people within the immigrant right, the people in groups within the immigrant rights movement who have understood uh, the divisions between good and bad immigrants as false and who have pressed for a more inclusive understanding um, and kind of urged people who consider themselves part of that movement to adopt that more inclusive frame. But on the other hand, there's a lot of very, you know, kind of tossed off specific, even granular stuff in there because there are so many points of intersection between the criminal justice system and the immigration system that are, you know, ultimately things that a particularly motivated person could like adopt as a local agenda and make sure that their community is doing. So it does seem to a certain extent like, a, like you're writing for, you know, maybe those who have been 
sensitized to the issue of immigration under the current era in a way they might not have been when some of these systems were set up to begin with. Yeah, absolutely. And to be honest, you know, I, I'm very privileged to work and, and live in a bit of a bubble, right? So, so, and I told this to, to the, to the people who've really been my teachers, um, you know, many organizing groups in New York City, like Families for Freedom, um, New Sanctuary Coalition, um, uh, advocacy groups like the Immigrant Defense Project and others, you know, they have been saying this for a really long time, right? So we had a moment in the immigrant rights movement, a really big moment in 2006, um, when there was a bill, a Sunson Brenner bill that was proposing criminalizing um, undocumented status, where we saw, you know, thousands and thousands of people take to the streets in protest. And it was a beautiful moment, a really rich moment for immigrant rights organizing. Um, but it was also a moment where a lot of people were out in the streets holding signs that said, we are not criminals, right? And so my good friends at Families for Freedom and all these other organizations, you know, people who have been facing deportation, who've lost loved ones um, because somebody had an old criminal conviction a long time ago, um, they were like, whoa, you know, that is that is not the divide that we want to be making. Um, nor is it is it the kind of divide that we want to be making, given the fact that you know one in three Americans has had contact with the criminal um, legal system. You know, this is this is not the way we want to divide up our people because it's going to have a disproportionate impact on people of color, and poor people, and people, our loved ones, our family members. So since that time, um, even before that time, but that was a real watershed moment. You know, for a decade, right? Um, organizing groups have been really pushing back and saying. Okay, if you're part of the immigrant rights movement, please do not adopt a good versus bad immigrants narrative. It's only going to come back to hurt us, right? And there was tons of progress. Um, you know, I will say that the, a lot of organizations, you know, recognize that we're we're coming up with more inclusive policies, and you know, and then and then Trump got elected, and and it was a horrific thing, and people were incredibly. Um, scared, you know, visceral re reaction that people had, like living in their homes. Am I going to be able to come home and put my kids to bed today? It was a, it was a horrible moment. And the immigrant rights community really embraced um, the, this notion of inclusiveness. Like we're all in the same boat. We all need to fight back. So all of that was great. And I, I never once thought during any of that time that I needed to write a book about the good versus bad immigrants myth. So what changed for me wasn't actually Trump, um, because as you mentioned, if anything, he brought more people into the fold, more people who never really thought about immigration policy, who didn't realize that President Obama had deported 3 million people. Like a lot of people who were just not aware suddenly saw it because he was so obvious about what he was doing and why that they realized it was a problem. So it wasn't, it wasn't because of him. I decided to write this book because I was literally sitting outside of City Hall in, in New York um, listening to a presentation by members of Mayor de Blasio, a progressive New York City, um, uh, our progressive New York City mayor, members of his administration proposing to cut funding um, for legal defense for immigrants to immigrants who had certain criminal convictions. So during you know, the, the, the rise in deportations under the Obama administration, New York City did a wonderful thing and they decided to fund uh, the country's first public defender system, the New York Immigrant Family Unity Project. Um, and it was this incredible achievement that was due to the organizing by incredible groups here in the city um, to, to create this funding and ensure that any New Yorker who got locked up would get a lawyer. It's a basic right that our, our federal law does not recognize. So the city stepped in and said, we're going to do it. We're going to make it universal. And what does our, our like New York City mayoral administration do um, in the era of Trump? Um, they make a decision that some people uh, who are uh, deemed public safety threats because of their old records don't deserve to have a lawyer. And so I, I literally sat outside of the city council meeting talking to a friend of mine who was also uh, an immigrant rights lawyer for an hour. And we just sat there saying, it's 2017. Why are we having this conversation in New York City? Um, why are we having this conversation about why uh, public defense is important for everyone, why every there are certain basic rights that every individual deserves, why um, it not only harms that individual, it harms the whole community um, if we allow people to go defenseless into deportation proceedings. And why are these, um, this language about public safety, why is this coming from somebody who is a progressive individual, a person who espouses 
values, who cares about immigrants, who cares about the criminal legal system. I mean, it, so it was at that moment that it became clear to me that um, that we needed to come to a baseline understanding of why dividing immigrants up into good and bad is racist, it's harmful, and it doesn't make us safer. And we needed that understanding to, to include some of those big picture policy ideas that will take a different president to implement, but also these really small kind of granular, you know, um, concepts that a, a city, a county, a state can adopt. Um, because, you know, doing something like universal legal defense, um, funding community-led, uh, immigrant-led organizations who provide mutual aid um, to, their, to their communities, uh, working with people to, to stop collaboration between your local government and ICE. These are policies that have been developed and we need to, we need to not be rolling them back, we need to be pushing them forward. And so, you know, in my solutions chapter, um, I do try and outline some of these changes um, to create a blueprint that different people can, can adopt. Because to be honest, my, my audience it isn't, it's certainly not the people who believe what Trump is doing is right. You know, they're, they're not the people that I'm trying to reach with this book. It's the people who want to do right by immigrants, but still, despite the, our best intentions, adopt that kind of good versus bad mentality um, and, and are trying to build our immigration system around it um, and, and, and think that we're going to achieve justice when all we're going to do and what history shows is that what we're going to do is build a bigger deportation machine if we believe that there are some group of people out there for whom deportation is justified. I'd like to take this opportunity to encourage folks to use the ask a question button that you can see right diagonally to the down and to the right of the uh, big green button to buy Alina's book, which you should also click. Um, I will be looking at those in a second. I'm now going to turn on the light in my apartment because I didn't understand this very well. But actually, while I do that, Alina, can you talk a little bit, like maybe vamp about what's a, a recent like win that you and your team have had that you want to take a minute to brag about? <laughs> a win? Well, that's really hard. Um, you know, I have to say the most recent win, again, was in collaboration with other organizations, um, Make the Road New York, uh, Brooklyn Defender Services. We were able to get one of our clients out of immigration jail um, because he was medically vulnerable to COVID-19 um, and to get him back with his family. Um, it felt like a, a pretty big win because he was also an individual who was a target of a very violent ICE raid um, in his home. He was tased uh, many times, uh, 20 times, and they actually created the medical vulnerability that was now putting his life at risk given COVID-19. And I think, you know, it was a victory um, uh, because all of these feel like victories when ICE comes and tries to take someone away. Um, we've seen it happen so quickly um, that it's really hard uh, to not uh, to, to find a way to fight. Um, but it was also a victory because the, the city, you know, the, and I, I don't mean to, to be too negative on the city, the city has an incredible city council and many people, um, uh, organizations and communities really stood up and fought back because even before this pandemic, you know, ICE has been a public safety risk, like ICE and immigration enforcement knocking um, on someone's door in the in the middle of the night and telling them you're the police and asking them to come out and then handcuffing them and, and snatching them away into a jail. Like that is a violent event. And I think one downside in a way of ICE just continuing like its level of violence is that people forget that. I think if there's one other thing I want my book to do is to just remind people that what deportation is, um, you know, we, we have treated it, we've normalized it, um, and Trump has done a good job of normalizing it in many ways. Um, but it didn't start with him, and it's been there for a long time, and people have forgotten it's, it's you know, being deported is like, it's like getting an eviction notice, losing your job, getting divorced, having your kids taken away from you, and being sent to a place where you might be persecuted or tortured, all wrapped up in one administrative order that is given to you without the right to counsel and maybe not even by a judge. And we do all of those things in the name of like a civil legal system where, you know, it's a bureaucracy basically. We do that and we don't even, we don't even question it. Um, and so I think if people can focus on the harm that deportation does, that it makes everyone less safe, 
um, whether it is the person who's gotten deported or the, the families that they've left behind, you know, maybe we'll, we'll be able to have a better conversation and, and move uh, conversations about victories away from, you know, saving one person from something that should have never happened to him to really changing the system as a whole. So uh, I'm, I'm going to have to see who's asking, who's asking these questions so that I can attribute them appropriately. Um, but Lena asked, first of all, how is the criminal, non-criminal, or violent, non-violent paradigm playing out in the litigation to free people from detention because of COVID-19? Yeah, so this is a big, um, a big problem. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with this because you've come to this book talk. But obviously, um, even as there's been progress in how we talk about the racist nature and problems of the criminal legal system, um, there still is a divide in, in when we talk about folks in prison, in jails, um, those who deserve their quote unquote second chance um, based on whether or not they've committed a violent or nonviolent offense. And that, that problem is um, always amplified, you know, immig adding immigration on top of the, on the criminal legal system just amplifies the flaws in both systems. So you see the same thing happening in immigration. And I should pause to note, like, you know, one of the reasons it bothers many of us who work with folks who are facing this, this idea of the violent versus non-violent divide, is that again, it, it ignores the fact that if you care about violence, if you think violence is wrong, then you should be the first person standing up asking for prisons and jails to be abolished, right? Like prisons and jails do not solve violence, they just concentrate it and they make it worse. And they harm the families of people who are left behind and they create cycles where we're never able to actually move past the harms that have been done and we just perpetuate them. So that's my quick talk about violence versus nonviolence. In the immigration system, we're seeing this play out too, right? So. Uh, it still boggles my mind, again, uh, over 30,000 people locked up any given night um, in jails. The, the number has been higher under this administration, 50,000. The only reason it's lower is because the Trump administration has blocked um, asylum seekers from coming in the country when they used to be locking them up too. Um, but it's, it's been lowered. And so we have 30,000 people any given night who are locked up in jails. And ICE refuses to release them by saying that they're, they're public safety risks. And they do in their press releases, um, in you know, in their um, in their statements to, to the media, they will pick the case of somebody who has a, a violent conviction on their record. They will use the most egregious circumstances. Uh, Dara, I know you have a great piece um, from last year where you talk about how Trump's favorite line is like, "The immigrants are coming over the borders to kill you." Like, you know, they they have this stump speech down very pat and they will pick out cases to, to highlight their points. Um, and I think because of that, um, obviously ICE, but also courts, when it's gone to court, they've bought into this as well. Instead of actually asking, does it make sense to lock up a person because they lack paperwork in a jail where they are at significantly heightened risk of dying because of their paperwork? Does that make sense? Is that the right thing um, for us to do under our constitutional protections, under our systems of law? Is that the right thing to do? Or should we be debating? Oh no. Hey, Alina, could you um, could you try and um, refresh your browser? Your um, screen has frozen. This is where we hope that she can hear me. <laughs> we do have some great questions in the uh, in the question box there too. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Um, I am going to um, email her and make sure everything is okay. I'll be right back. I'll be here, everybody. <laughs> Sorry about this, folks. Thank you for bearing with us. Dana, if you want to plug um, your, your side of things, like um, your podcast. Or, oh, it looks like Alina has. Um, <laughs> there we go. Looks like she's uh, refreshing. <laughs> Do you ever ask about a feline intermission? My cat is currently sleeping on the other side of the couch. So she hasn't decided to show up yet. <laughs> I 
Um, to anybody asking, this will be recorded. Um, it'll live, the, the um, recording of this event will be available at this link just a few moments after um, the broadcast tonight. Um, Including this part? Even this part. <laughs> Pretty fun. <laughs> All right, I just shot her a text. Yeah, um, Andrea in the chat is asking a great question. Um, Dara, what did you think about the book? I'm always moderately embarrassed when I read immigration books that actually like teach me something, mm -hmm. <laughs> to be honest. Um, and so, and, you know, in addition to obviously so many of Alina's stories are grounded in like what she's seen through the eyes of her clients and getting these very, you know, the, the kind of determination to present these as complete people uh, mm -hmm. and to to profile them rather than just talking about, you know, the reason that they're in the book being their involvement with the, the criminal and immigration systems. Like some of the history in there is, it's, it was, was I think particularly just, it wasn't something that I've had the opportunity to think about in a, thick way because if you look at legislative history you tend to see issues once they've already been in the public consciousness so. mm. and so to think about you know what happens before something becomes enough of a national priority that congress is talking about it or even that states are talking about it or the kind of ideological and social process that has an interplay with that policy is always it's it's always refreshing to kind of read things that have a feed in both worlds that don't think of politics as just what's being said in mass media, but also don't think of it as just what's in the law book. Certainly, absolutely. Um, Alina, we're just talking about you. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry for the, the technical difficulty. Okay, let me see. Are you getting an echo? No. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> Sorry about that. I had to switch to my phone because my uh, internet cut out. I guess this is the uh, way we live these days in this new world. And um, so maybe getting to another question. Uh, mm -hmm. Vanessa wanted to know, wanted to hear you address the criminalization of asylum seekers by administrative rather than legislative means. Sure. So I think this has been a particular hallmark of the Trump administration, although certainly if you go back to the 1996 laws, which is where a lot of the modern day criminalization provisions um, come from, which is which are laws signed up the Clinton administration, you start to see um, more of this criminalization of asylum seekers. And you're certainly seeing it here today. Um, obviously, the biggest change is what's happening right now, which is that people aren't being allowed to come in at all. Um, but even before that, um, people being locked up in jails, whole families, um, was significant, as well as uh, what we've been seeing for a long time, which is uh, really the, the criminalization of people through the federal criminal system. And that's something that, again, um, I talk a bit about in my book, um, it's also been uh, covered, I think, thanks in part to uh, the presidential race. There have been a lot of the candidates who have actually been willing to talk about the criminalization of migration itself and the role that it plays with people who are trying to seek asylum, um, that people have a better understanding. But essentially, and you know, we were talking about the national origin quotas in the 1920s, when people were presented from coming to the U.S. based on what country they were from and really their race, there was a compromise that was reached that allowed people um, in the Western Hemisphere to still come, not part of those quotas. And that was something that some agricultural businesses wanted so that Mexican and Central American um, people could come to the U.S. and work on farms. And that didn't sit well with the uh, xenophobes and the eugenicists who pushed for the quota laws. And so in 1929, um, a segregationist senator uh, came up with a compromise to um, criminalize migration. And that way, 
when you didn't want um, uh, an immigrant, you know, in your community anymore, uh, when you ready to, to stop um, immigration at a particular time, you could actually lock people up on criminal charges. And so before 1929, you know, this wasn't criminalized at all. You could, if there were some civil requirements and violations, but it wouldn't end you, it wouldn't cause you to end up locked up in prison. Um, so that has been around on the books for a long time. It had a dramatic impact on the prison system. Um, Kelly Hernandez talks a lot about this in the great work that she's done. And we've seen that become more the fore recently in the 1990s, 2000s. The Obama administration really expanded this um, and the whole program called Operation Streamline, the Trump administration has adopted throughout um, the Southwest border where people are prosecuted in groups of 70. Um, you know, when I went to observe one of these horrific hearings, you know, you're literally seeing people shuffling into a room, their um, legs, uh, chained and chained together um, and you know your hands are only to the point where they can put on a headset so they can hear a transmission of a group talking to them all together um, telling them they have to, you know, they're facing criminal charges and ask them how they plead. I mean for people who travel so far just to have a chance at a better life um, to seek protection um, to be treated this way uh, and then at, by that point all they want is freedom and so they give up the very fundamental rights that um, the asylum is designed to protect. And so that's just one of the many ways in which we've seen a significant criminalization of asylum seekers at the border. Uh, apologies to everyone who has, who has noted the sound quality issues. Uh, Politics and Crows is trying to address that on their end. We'll see what we can do. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> Uh, so Annette asks, is there a particular organization or website? Oh, oh, sorry. Should we be? You no, 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 you're totally fine. Um, Alina, if you potentially have, um, like a, a headphones or like a headset, um, at hand that might solve the, um, the sound problem, but if not, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we've only got time for a couple more questions anyway. All right. Let me see. So sorry. Hold on. Okay. <laughs> Let me see if I can. Oh, no worries. Fabulous. Let's see if this works. I'm gonna go away. <laughs> Uh, so, so right. So, finishing the question, um, Annette asks: Is there a particular organization or website that can advise voters nationwide as to against immigrant rights? You definitely have a question that I can answer for reasons of journalistic objectivity. But um, sorry, first let me check: Is this better? Yes, so much. Perfect. Okay. Sorry about that. The cliff notes on my prior answer was related to Operation Streamline. So hopefully you all will have a chance to learn more about that if you don't already know about how horrible it is. Um, but sorry, uh, Dara, you were asking about organizations? Yeah, we're people... for a website that can advise people about the immigration, you know, like who, of, of politicians' immigration stances. Oh, politicians' immigration stances. So that's a great question. Um, the places that I've always gone to get the best information about different policies and ways that people can get involved in fighting back against criminalization include the Detention Watch Network. Um, they have a website um, that contains a lot of current campaigns that communities are pursuing, as well as um, the uh, Immigrant Defense Project, which has a specialization around criminalization. So I definitely plug those places as ways to learn more about what communities are asking for. In terms of politicians, um, you know, we're at a moment now where the field has narrowed and the platforms of our two uh, competitors are not what they should be, but there is room for growth and well, on one side. And so um, there are groups right now that are trying to, um, to gather and collect 
the best practices and what people are hoping, um, particularly from the, the Biden um, uh, camp, what we're hoping that he uh, may adopt. And so um, there are a couple of different um, uh, platforms um, around migrant justice and migrant freedom that people are advocating for. And so I would look to those. Um, and I know that several of the groups, whether it's United We Dream, uh, Detention Watch Network and others, participate in coming up with those platforms. Um, and the National Immigrant Justice Center is another organization that has thought a lot about what a national platform should look at look like. So I would recommend going there. Um, the, la the last question for us is, it kind of ties into the closing, uh, or, or kind of kicks, kicks it back to politics and prose a little bit. Um, are you aware of other books on immigration that you would recommend? It mentions uh, Adam Goodman's The Deportation Machine, which I admit I have a e copy of and I haven't read yet. Um, I feel like this was the spring for a lot of very deeply historically informed immigration <laughs> books. Um, but what what other recommendations would you make book wise for people who want to learn more? Well, there is a book coming out this month um, by John Washington called The Dispossessed, and it focuses on asylum, which I know is of interest from what I could tell from the chat screen from many people who might be uh, watching. Um, so I definitely recommend that. Um, I just was having a conversation today with Erica Lee, uh, who wrote a history of xenophobia called America for Americans. Um, and I think that's a great book to read. Um, and uh, there's Migrating to Prison, uh, which is specifically about abolishing immigration uh, detention, the, the immigration jail and prison system. So uh, those are some of the books that I would recommend. Um, there's really a wealth of information out there. Hopefully that will create a blueprint for change uh, for future administrations. Oh, and of course, all of your writing. I was telling um, uh, Derek earlier that uh, we regularly quote and cite her articles in all of our federal lawsuits because she gets the information first. So thank you for everything you do to expose what the administration is doing. Just trying to keep on top of everything. It's a hard job. Thank you both so much for this conversation and, and for sticking with it. Um, and thank you everybody for, um, for staying with us um, tonight through this excellent conversation, um, even with the technical difficulties. I have one last question for you both, um, and that's what are you reading during this time? I'm a little bit between books right now. I uh, had not read any of the Wolf Hall trilogy by Hilary Mantel and devoured it in like 10 days. Awesome. Uh, which was probably too fast <laughs> because now I feel like I don't, I, you know, I want to take a while before starting anything else because that's, it was just really excellent fiction world building and writing. Um, well, I got an advanced copy of The Dispossessed, so I'm working through that now, which is great. And uh, sadly, reading a lot of court decisions, good and bad, um, hoping to see more good uh, over the next few weeks. Absolutely. Um, thank you both so much. Again, this was really, really excellent and definitely very timely. Um, we know the situation at um, prisons, especially with them. Um, you know, people wrongfully in prison is exacerbated by these times. Um, and thank you to everybody in our audience. Again, your patronage is what's letting us bring you this programming. It's what's keeping our doors open. Um, a independent small business um, like us really cannot continue functioning without um, the book sales to, to keep us open. So hit that big green button at the bottom and buy this very excellent book, um, No Justice in the Shadows by Alina Das. Um, Thank you so, so much for being here. You can oh, also hit the um, follow button up at the top near the Politics and Prose logo to be notified of our future, um, our future crowdcast. And we thank you so much. We hope you stay well. We hope you stay safe. And we hope you stay well read. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And thanks for bearing with the technical difficulties. It was really great to be in conversation with all of you. Definitely. Good night.
Good night. Bye. Bye.